All right, big up all viewers and listeners. Uh, we're here for another installment of Reasoning with Haru, uh, the podcast that I like to do where you know I interview some very interesting people from all different walks of life, people who are doing good work that I think that people should know about. Now, this brother I met about a year ago, and um, he came right, highly recommended from uh, some other close brothers that I know. And uh, he is a very serious person who's doing some very good things in the field of finance and credit. And um, basically what he does is he gets you ready to have a stellar credit profile to be able to make whatever moves that you need to make in this world, whether it's buying real estate, uh, you know, uh, buying a vehicle or leveraging your credit for other purposes for business or what have you. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to allow the brother to introduce himself. Brother I know is Brother Tyrone, and uh, he's a Yardie. So I always have a special place in my heart for Yardies. He's a reggae man, just like I am, too, you know what Definitely. I Definitely. Mean? You know, we can get into all of that, too, man. So, uh, Brother Tyrone, why don't you introduce yourself? Just tell people how old you are, what's your profession, all that, and then we can get into the conversation. No problem, man. So first of all, I just want to say give thanks. Thank you for allowing me on your platform, you know. And um, for the listening audience, people are hearing me for the first time. Obviously, my name is Tyrone Senior. And as Brother Heru mentioned, I was born in Jamaica, came here when I was 18 years old. So when I came to this country, um, my dad was the one that introduced me to the whole um, credit industry, the credit system. So my dad had a, um, an apartment, a condominium. Let me, let me just let me just interrupt interrupt you real quick. When no you, problem. This, when you say this country, be more specific because I got listeners from all over the world. Okay. Tuning in, so um, let them know what you're talking about. You say this country. No problem. So yeah, so I, I you know reintroducing myself. So my name is Tyrone Senior. When I left Jamaica, I came here to the United States of America when I was 18 years of age. And when I came here, my father was the one that basically introduced me to the whole credit industry. Now, that's that's my first introduction to credit. So I knew the importance, importance of credit in the United States of America because of my dad. Now, what I did, always maintain a decent credit, went to school, went to college, was offered the credit cards. I definitely took them, but I realized that from right off the bat that it's important to make sure you make the payments on these cards. So I did that. I was able to maintain a decent credit score, over 700, right? So what happened, you know, eventually after I finished college, worked in corporate America for a little bit, decided that I wanted to do my own business, partnered up with my friend to do a property management business and um, decided that it's time for me to purchase my own home. At the time I was renting, decided that, okay, it's time for me to, get my own home, um, purchase my own home. Went to the mortgage banker, right, to get a mortgage. And then the mortgage banker came back to me and told me that I did not qualify for the mortgage because of my credit rating, because of my credit score. So obviously, you know, I thought that he made a mistake because just 30 days before me going into the mortgage company, I looked at my credit score. So I know that I, and at that time I had a 750 credit score. So he told me that I had a 604 credit score. So when he told me that and he reran it and he came back, the same number, 604, after doing a little digging, after I left the mortgage company, it turned out that I was a victim of identity theft, right? So somebody basically stole my identity. Now, what happened is because I have decent credit, the, I had a credit card with Bank of America. And what happened, Bank of America would send out these credit checks so that I can write myself a credit check. I can basically do a balance transfer. I just put deposit it in my bank account. But the male person, instead of putting it, I lived in, I lived in an apartment complex at the time. Instead of putting the, the mail with the checks in my mailbox, he put it in the next door neighbor's mailbox. And that next door neighbor, right, took that check and had a bar basically wrote himself the check i found that out after i did my investigation but basically what happened now i decided that okay i have to hire a credit repair company hired the credit repair company unfortunately the credit repair company was not able to unfortunately i should say the credit repair company was not able to help me you know fortunately for me you know this is what forced me into the credit industry because now i started to do research read went to a lot of seminars, study. Eventually, I was able to fix my own credit, help a couple of friends and family, 
then and then I was encouraged by you know my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, to basically start a credit, you know, a company and, and, and do credit restoration. So that's basically a little nutshell about me and how I got involved in the credit industry, you know. Okay. So let, let, let's talk about it. Um the credit industry, get into that business. What are some of the challenges? of getting into the credit industry, what are some of the things that you have to do in terms of due diligence to learn more? Because I know that the credit whole industry changes from time to time. And some people, you know, have outdated ways of doing things with credit. And some people, you know, have some newer techniques that have to do with some of the new applications that are going on in credit and different savvy ways to kind of beat the system and to stay on top of the system. So, yeah. So, the, so with, when it comes down to credit, um, the bottom line, everybody know the importance of credit. So I'm not gonna get into, you know, what, what we need credit for. Most people that 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 um come to me, they, they come to me because they, they weren't able to qualify for a home or a car or anything like that. But in terms of the credit, now if you have what, what we need to be careful of, because I know that the, the internet is flooded with information. And I like to tell people we always have to go back to the basics. And when I say go back to basics. We have a lot of different tech. I can give you a bunch of different tactics and plays and all of these stuff to do, but the credit reporting agency always get caught up to all of that stuff. So when 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 we're helping people that have you know negative information on their credit, we always encourage people that the first thing that you need to do is definitely always want to get a copy of your credit report and you always want to get a copy of your credit score, but you always have to be goal oriented. So if you decide that okay, then you're gonna purchase a home, you're gonna purchase a car. You have to understand that there are a bunch of different credit scores out there. There are over 400 different credit scores out there. You know, you have two major credit scoring companies. You have the Vantage Credit Scoring Company and you, have an, and you have the FICO Credit Scoring Company. Now, the reason why I say you have to be goal-oriented, right? You can be looking at one particular score and have like, a, so for example, if you might be looking at your Vantage score. And if anybody go to creditkarma.com, Credit Karma give you what you call your Vantage 3.0 credit score. So you might have a creditkarma.com, which is a, you know, a website that gives you access to your credit scores for free. And you might be looking on that site and see that, oh, I have a 750 credit score. However, when you look on my FICO, that's that same 750 score might end up being a 640 credit score. So this is why I'm saying that if you are going to purchase a specific good, if you're going to purchase a specific service, whatever you're going to do, you want to make sure that if you're going to purchase a home, you can't be looking at your Vantage score. You have to look at your FICO score and, 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 and it even get deeper because if you're looking at your FICO score, you want to look at your mortgage score, your mortgage FICO score because that score is different than from your credit card scores. Now, I know a lot of this might sound complicated, but that's the reason why they do that. The credit system was created to complicate things. They don't want the average person, me and you, to understand it, because this is how the banks, because this, this whole thing is a game. This whole credit system is a game. You have the banks, you have the collection agencies, you have the consumer. These are the players of the game, and then you have the credit reporting agency. Now, obviously, the banks, the credit reporting agency, the collection agency, they understand the game. The person that don't understand the game is me and you, the consumer, because we are the ones that are being taken advantage of. So how, cre uh, how credit work, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm keeping this simple because I don't want to get too much into the details and lose anybody. We just need to understand the basics, all right? Pay your bills on time. So with, with credit, the whole system is set up to put you in debt. So if you have a credit card, most people run away from credit card. But the important thing to understand here, if you have a credit card, you should always have a credit card. You get at least one credit card. Because for the banks, that is considered a risky debt. When you have a credit card report and your credit report, you tend to get a higher score, a quicker score once you use that credit card responsibly. Okay, so meaning that you pay the bills on time, you make sure that the balances are low, you want to keep the balance at zero or 5% of the credit limit. So if you have a $1,000 credit card, you want to make sure that the balance on that $1,000 credit card is what? $50, okay, now, which is 5%. Let me, let me just stop you there. Yeah. When you talk about the balance, you're talking about the reported balance. The reported Whereas balance. You'd have to know exactly the day where they start reporting the balance on the card. So you can have, let's say within that 30 days, 
you can have 90% usage on your card. But on the day that it's being reported, let's just say that it gets reported on the first of every month, right? On that day, the day before, you want it to be at 5%. Before that, it can be at whatever you want it to be. But when they report it, that's where you want it at 5% or you know 10% below. Some people say 30% below um, your uh, limit. So if it's the... Uh, if you have a thousand dollar limit, you know, they say, you know, don't let them report more than three hundred dollars being used in your account, which is what we're calling a balance. But you're saying keep it at 10 to 5 percent, which would be like one hundred dollars or fifty dollars. Yes. Ideally, I want it at five percent. And the reason why I say that, too. So what you're saying is very important. Yes, you want to make sure that it's like that before they report it. Right. Now, the reason why I speak like this, because it depends on the, the person that you're talking to, because. You have to have a certain level of discipline. So if I'm talking to a business person like you, Brother Heru, you are you are using the credit card for certain things. Like if you're not using it to shop and have fun. You know, you're using it for business purposes. So ideally, you want to use the business, business um, the, the, the credit card. Ideally, you definitely want to use it, but make sure you pay off the balance or pay it to 5%, you know, um, before it's reported to the credit reporting agency. And usually that is when the billing statement ending date. So you look at your billing statement. And 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 um when when that statement ends, that's usually when they report it to the credit reporting agency. So if the billing period runs from January first to January thirty first, then you know that you have to pay it by January thirty first. So if it runs from January tenth to, to February twentieth, then you know that you have to pay it by February. I usually tell people at least two days before because it depends on the weekends and stuff like that. Sometimes they might report it a little earlier or after if it falls on a holiday or a weekend. So I always tell people make sure you do it at least three days before. No, no. Obviously, when it comes under credit, we have to develop discipline. You know what I mean? So I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm talking about even with the credit cards. So with the credit cards, the reason why that is so important because that's a risky debt for the banks. So that's why you want to make sure you get credit card. I know a lot of people might have been burned in the past and they say, you know what? I do not want a credit card. No, it's very important that you get a, even get a, one credit card if you're just starting out. If you're thinking, as, as we as Africans and Black people, once we understand the credit system, Right. What we want to do, you want to get multiple credit cards, but you have to first develop discipline. Notice I keep stressing that because you have a lot of people. What happens is that they get these credit cards, they make some bad investments, and now they're not able to pay down the credit cards. And that is what helps to ruin our credit. So what we want to do here, the goal here is we need to understand we're using credit as leverage to build wealth. So when it comes on to your personal credit, right? Ideally, what you want to do, you want to build up your personal credit. But if a per but if you're thinking in terms of really playing the credit game, you want to make sure you have a corporation or a business. Because what you are going to do, you are going to want, you're going to want to get business credit card. And that is how you're going to really play the game and put all the risk in your business name. So for, for the average person that's just starting out now, right? And thinking, okay, then I want to play the game of credit. I don't have any credit. I don't have a lot of credit. What do I need to do? So this is what you need to do. You, If you can get a friend or a family member that has a credit card, they pay the bills on time consistently for at least two years. That's the best. They pay the bills on time. They have the credit card for at least two years. They have a high credit limit. You know, so the credit limit is $10,000, you know, or even higher. The higher the credit limit, I want to say credit limit is that, that's basically the amount of money that you are risk that the credit card company is giving you, right? So once they can add you, if they can add you as an authorized user to that credit card, then what that's gonna do, that's gonna basically advance the credit system, but thinking that that's your credit card thing is gonna give the credit the credit system the impression that you are the one that owns that credit card. So because of that, you're gonna get a high credit score. And once you have that, you can now apply for your own credit card. So one, because the credit, they're not going to pay, pay, pay attention to the fact that it's an authorized user. Most of these credit card companies don't. They're just looking at your credit score and the payment history. Once this computer made a decision. So once you actually get, and you know, of course you have to put income, but they're not going to fact check that. So really and truly, uh, you, can, you know, if you are making ten thousand dollars and you live in an apartment complex and your next door neighbor is making a hundred thousand, they ask for the household income, so you can put you know a hundred and twenty thousand. So 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 um so basically once you once you put that down and you get that credit card in your name now, 
your whole goal, and this is for somebody that want to play the, the credit game, all right, and use it as leverage to build wealth, to fund businesses and all of that. Your goal is to try and get that credit limit as high as possible, okay? So once you have that credit card, if you're going to buy something, you want to use that credit card, run up that balance all the way. So if you if you, if you got a credit card for like $10,000, you need to buy furniture for your home. You want to make sure you have the cash flow to pay, to pay for that furniture. But rather than going into your bank account and taking that money out, you're going to use that credit card, spend it, so spend like $9,000, whether you need to furnish your house, whatever you need to do. And then once you do that, right, then you want to pay that down quickly before the due date. And once you pay that down, then now what you're going to do, you do that consistently for about three to six months. You're now going to go to that bank and ask them for a higher credit limit. Then let them know that, you know, this, the, the amount of money that they give you is not enough. And you know you want to you want to get a higher credit limit either because you plan to buy something, and most of the time when you look at your credit card and see that you definitely use it and pay it off, they will increase that limit. Now, once that happens, you're gonna keep doing that, rinse and repeat. You want to get an LLC. Now, even if you're not planning to do any business, you're working corporate America. It's always important. Just get a corporation. You don't have to be an LLC. You can speak to an accountant. This 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 company that you're getting is just for investment purposes or consulting. All right. Now, once you get this, once you once you get this company, this LLC, what you're going to do now is you're going to try and you're going to get a credit card in that company's name. All right. Now, you might have to put a personal guarantee. You know, there are certain credit cards that you can get where, where even though you put in a personal guarantee, if for some apparent reason later on down the line, and the reason why you're getting this credit card for this corporation is, is so that you can use it and limit the amount of risk that you're putting on your personal credit. So when you get this corporation, the first thing you're going to do is apply for a credit card in the name of this corporation. And what tends to happen, because it's a new corporation and you're just building credit, they are going to look on your personal credit to see how you handle your personal finances. And once they look and see that you have a high credit limit, right, you are going to get a credit card equivalent or even higher than the credit limit that you have on your personal credit. And then once that happens, this is how you really start to play the game of credit now. So what you want to do, you want to spend using that business credit card if you need to buy something, if you need to invest. That's where you want to spend as much, get as much credit card, uh, um, get as get as much get as much other credit cards in that business name, and that's when you start to use it. Spend whatever you need to spend. If somebody comes to you and want to invest in the business, you need to. That is the you're doing everything in the business name. Now the reason why we're saying that everybody sometimes you hit hard times. So like for example, a good example was the pandemic. A lot of people wasn't working. That wasn't expected. So I find that a lot of people had you know the fact that, that they hit some financial problems. But if you were you, if you are the type of person now that you, you do exactly what I just said to do, you're spending in your business name and everything like that, what do you think gonna happen? No, if you can't afford to pay the credit card and everything, the only thing that is gonna be messed up is your business credit, but your personal credit will still be intact because that information, if you missed a payment, if you have high balances, that is not gonna be reporting to the personal credit. That's only gonna be reporting on the business credit, all right? So, so, so the goal here is to build up the personal credit, but you don't want to use the personal credit because you only have one personal credit. You definitely want to leverage the personal credit, get the LLCs, and put the credit cards in the business name. All right? Was that clear? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was very clear. And I mean, these are some of the strategies that I use as well. So I'm glad that you are breaking it down. The only um, caveat that I would say is that there are some companies, credit card companies, I'm not sure if it's American Express, that at times if you do have um, business credit card, or maybe it might be going straight through a bank. But I think there's one or two of my business credit cards that do get reported into my personal. Yes. So uh, this is why I know. Report. I'm glad you mentioned that. So even though I'm giving this advice, you have to know which card to do. American Express is not the one that you're going to play games with. Um, Capital One um, opens, Capital One is one of those cards so that report to your personal credit. All right. So, and then you have, um, and Chase, Chase have a card that reports to the personal credit. So there are certain cards that you can do this with. So even I'm giving you the information, but it's not every credit card. A good card that you can do this with is like a city, 
Financial, right. uh, Elan, uh, uh, and um, Flagstar. These type of cards, even though you put in that personal guarantee, if you become delinquent on those cards, usually they don't report to the credit reporting agency. Right, right. Right, they only stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, so what I learned, and I, I learned this from you, by the way, um, what I do when I'm getting a business credit card, I will actually ask them if they report. Before I get it, I'll ask them, mm -hmm. do you report to my personal credit score? And if they say yes, that's a card I typically don't get. But if they yeah. say no, because I'm trying to separate my business dealings from my personal dealings. Right. And sometimes, you know, with business, you might not want to pay down that card right away for that month. You might want to pay a minimum or whatever. So now your balance is over that 10% or that 5% because you're dealing with business. You're dealing with volume. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you might want two, three months leeway. And that might hurt your score. Not that you're going to be late with any payments. You're going to always pay on time. You're going to pay the minimums at least that's due. But you might want a little bit more leeway to not have to pay down to get to down to, you know, 5% usage or what have you for a couple months, have that breathing room. But you don't want that to affect your personal credit score. So I think it's a good strategy to actually call them. And the credit card companies, I mean, they'll pick up the phone and you mm -hmm. ask that question. If they say, yeah, we reported personally, you know, your business credit to your, you know, account. And, you know, what's really interesting, some of them only report, they don't report the good things on your credit. No, the bad things. The bad things on your credit. That's American Express. Yeah. Yeah. I'm speaking from experience because yeah. one of the things, you know, what when we deal with, when, when, I, I can boldly say that during the pandemic, I hit a rough spot, you know, and I had the American Express card and it definitely hit, went to the personal credit. The good thing is that I understand how to dispute these stuff. Mm -hmm. and get it off you know I, and i know how to build back the relationship and that's one of the things I'll, I'll tell people to so like if you got if you're gone if you've been through a situation and um and yeah like uh, for example with an american express card right and and it hits your personal credit right now you're back on your foot you're making some money what you can do once you have to first of all you want to make sure you mend that relationship. If you want to keep that relationship going with American Express, you don't want to just, you can always dispute this stuff and get it off your, your personal credit. And once it charge off, the, after a certain period of time, they can't come after you for that debt. But if you decide to go back to them, to do business with them, like to get another card, they're not going to give it to you. Right. Seven years, nine years, 10 years. But as a business person, and because we understand the power of leverage rather than using your own money, it, it behooves you to just build back that relationship, work out a payment arrangement with them and just pay them back the money. Because you know that in the long term, it's going to benefit you as a business person. And that is only if you want to keep that good relationship. All right. So ideally, you, you, you don't want to get those cards, you know, but but sometimes, you know, you might be doing something like at the time when I got the American Express card. I knew that I was running a risk that if I don't pay it, it was going to go on my personal credit. But for, for years, I was paying it, and they weren't reporting it at all. But right. as soon as you miss that payment, I got that alert. Hit the personal credit. I'm like, these people don't play, yeah. right? So these are some of the things that is important that you're, you're aware of. You know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. So now, when somebody comes to you for your services, what can they expect when they work with you? So the first thing that we do, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pull the credit report, obviously, and you pull it. And when you, when, once we pull the credit report, it's a soft inquiry, all right? Now, obviously, the next the next thing we're going to ask you, what is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? All right, let's, stop, people, you, let's stop you there. Um, mm -hmm. can you tell people the difference between a soft inquiry and a hard inquiry. So a soft inquiry is basically when, um, if you're just pulling your credit report to look at it to see what's going on, it don't have a negative impact on your credit score, all right? Usually when you have a hard inquiry is when you're trying to get, to make a purchase, you're trying to get some kind of services, okay? So, and that have a negative impact on your credit. So if you're trying to buy a house, you're trying to buy a car, you know, you're trying to get furniture, you're trying to get a credit card, what is going to happen is that institution that you're trying to get that credit card or that loan from to purchase that car or to get that mortgage, they're going to look at your credit profile to see, you know, if, if you are a viable client for them to work with. And by them doing that, they are requesting that information from the credit reporting agency. And that is what you call a hard inquiry. But a soft inquiry is when somebody is just you know, looking at your credit, probably because they want to advertise to you or when you are looking at your credit yourself. 
that's considered a soft inquiry because you're not really doing it to get a specific goods or services. So that's the difference. So when you have a soft inquiry, it don't it don't have it has absolutely no impact on your credit score. You don't lose any points. But with a hard inquiry, you can lose up to two, ten. Sometimes so I've seen people lose up to ten points after credit scores. So you definitely want to avoid that. All right. So that's yeah. the difference there. So when they come to me you now, the first thing that we do is get, you know, we, we ask them to, to we send them a link so that we can get access to the credit report and scores. OK, once we get access to the credit report and scores, we want to find out what why do you want? Why you want to fix your credit? Is there something that is it something specific that you're trying to accomplish? You know, most people, if they come to me, like, for example, if, if it's a business person, they're saying, well, I'm trying to get this business loan. OK then we know that we have to deal with their credit restoration differently. That person might have nine negative information on the credit. It don't make any sense if you, you, you spend time disputing all nine negative information when that is not going to really help them to get whatever loan they need to get. So if they tell me that they're trying to get a business loan, I know that one of the first things that this most business company look at is the amount of inquiries that they have on the credit report so we know that we're going to have to focus if they have bankruptcy if one of the negative information that they have on the credit report is a bankruptcy then we know we're going to have to focus on that if it's um if it's like a few collection account with a zero balance or some charge off and it's been on the credit report for like two three years then we're not going to put our energy on that immediately so our focus is going to be to get rid of the inquiries and our focus is going to be to get rid of the bankruptcy because we know once we get rid of that what i almost say get rid of that meaning disputing it we're going to look and see what are the errors here can we use the laws called the fair credit reporting act you know basically what that law is it states that any information that is on your credit report is supposed to be reported a hundred percent accurate the date that the account was open, the balance that the account that, that you have on the account, all of these metrics, it needs to be 100% accurate. And that is what the Fair Credit Reporting Act states. If it's not 100% accurate, then the company either has to fix it or if they don't, if they're not able to fix it, then they have to delete it from your credit file. Okay. So our goal now is to focus on what errors are reporting here for that bankruptcy. What, you know, the, the, the inquiry, did they get, did they go through the proper channel? Did you sign any paperwork for, for, for these hard inquiries to be on your credit reports? You know, and once we got through all of that, then we, we identify what those errors are. That is what we we'll focus on initially. If somebody's coming to me to purchase a home, if somebody says, okay, I'm trying to purchase a home, but I'm not able to, you know, then we're going to look on the credit. And the same profile with a bankruptcy, they have some collections account. That might be the bankruptcy. If the bankruptcy is more than two years, then that might that's not going to be an issue to get a mortgage to purchase a home. If they have a few inquiries, that is not going to be the focus. The focus is going to be on, on, on like the collection account with the balances and stuff like that. It's so, 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 so the point I'm trying to make is when you come to me, we want to find out your goal. If you come to me and say, Oh, I just want to get all of, rid of all of the negative information, then you know that. And I always tell people, because I know a lot of people come and sometimes they expect quick fix. And this is what a lot of companies advertise. They get your credit fixed in 30 days and all of that stuff. That's not something that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna mention to you. And I'm not going to tell you that um, we're going to guarantee that we can't get any information off your credit file. We can't do that. All right. We can't guarantee. We, you know, it's up to the only person that can guarantee that is the credit reporting agency are the people that put the information on your credit file. All right. Now. When you come to me, obviously, we're going to do, we do what you call legal disputes. So if you have certain negative information, repossession, charge off, collection accounts, right? We have two types of disputes that we do. We have your legal disputes, and we have um, a dispute where we, where we call a Metro 2. Now, Metro 2 basically is a language how the credit reporting agency communicate with the, 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 they call them the furnisher, which is like a bank of America. The people that give put information on your credit report, they are furnisher. So you can have like an American Express. You have a business card with American Express. But if they don't put the information on your credit report, they are not in the category of furnisher. Once they start to put the stuff on your credit report, now they are considered a furnisher. So basically, um, what, what we do now is we look, there are certain rules and regulation, which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act any information that is reporting to the credit reporting agency or the furniture communicate with the credit reporting agency they communicate through a computer language a software called metro 2 now there are ways that you can dispute electronically using metro 2 now these are not legal dispute but sometimes they might get some quick results 
Okay, a lot of companies tend to just use this way. The reason why I want to use legal disputes is just in case these credit reporting agencies or these collection agency or these creditors, original creditors, Bank of America, Chase, if they don't comply with the law and do what they're supposed to do, now we can use that as leverage to go after them. And there's a lot of different tactics and things that we can use, you know, because sometimes some people might come to me and they say, okay, then they have some... Um, you look at the credit report, and this is where a lot of credit repair companies get it wrong because when they are disputing, they might find all of these errors on the credit report, and they actually tell the credit reporting agency what the errors are. Like, please dispute the balance is not correct, or the date that. No, you don't want to tell them. You want them to do the investigation. Okay? So what we do is we write investigate the initial letter that we send out to credit reporting agency. If so, if there's an error, is is basically what we call an investigation letter, telling them that, hey, we pull a copy of our credit report, you notice some issues here, we need to do an investigation. Now, most of the time they don't do that because it's all electronic all stuff, you know, Equifax process their dispute in the Philippines, TransUnion process their dispute in India, and, and, um, and um, Experian in, the, in Chile, okay? So a lot of times when, you, when you're sending in these letters, most of the, these people receive over 10,000 pieces of mail on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So most of the time they put it through an electronic machine. And if the electronic machine is not able to read it, then they send it overseas. And these people don't have any kind of computer, no internet service. They just plug in a code, not mine. They, they don't read the letter. They don't look at the paperwork and just submit some kind of paperwork to your state that they do the investigation. All right? Now, you have a lot of people that use a lot of tactics and this is where some, sometimes it work. But what if it don't work? And this is where a lot of people get stuck. We work with attorneys, all right? So if for some apparent reason, this information is not able to, if they don't remove the information, then you have to sue them. That's how, you, that's how they're going to pay attention to you. So once you, so for example, like if you have a repossession on your credit report and you reached out, and this is a tactic. Let me just mention this for those people that don't know. If you have a repossession, all right, what's supposed to happen when you have a repossession on your credit report, right? For if and, and let's, let me explain this. If for some apparent, let, let me backtrack a little bit, I should say. If you have a car, you didn't pay the bill, and the car come and, and the auto dealer, or whomever you are paying, making the payments to come and take that car away from you. One of the things that that car dealership, you know, we, and we use different laws, one of the things that that auto dealer our, our financing company is supposed to, they're supposed to notify you. They're supposed to send certified mail to you to let you know that, hey, we have the car, we're giving you the opportunity to take back the car, all right? Now, the law that we use for that portion of it is that it's, it's called the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, all right? And within the Uniform Commercial Code, whenever they repossess the car, they're supposed to let you know that they repossess the car and let you know that, hey, we're giving you the opportunity to, to, to get back this car. Okay, now if they don't hear from you, the next thing that they're supposed to do is they are now supposed to, if they're gonna sell the car at an auction, they're supposed to let you know that, hey, we sell the car, this is how much you owe. No, they're supposed to send this certified mail. So this is one of the leverage that we use. So when somebody have a reposition, the first thing we do is re re reach out to that company and say, hey, send me proof that you sent me the letter letting me know that. I can get back this car. And most of the time, sometimes people might have the repossession and the credit report for a year or two. They can't provide that documentation, you know? And even if they provide the letter, that's not enough. They need to send proof that you actually received the letter, like a US tracking or something. And most of the time, these companies can produce that information. And if they cannot produce that, that means they need to come off your credit report. So that's one of the leverage, one of the stuff that we use if, you're, if, if we're disputing repossession. All right. You have any questions regarding that, Heru, or you no, want to no. continue? No, no, that was yeah. good. That was good. Yeah, so if so, if for some apparent reason they can provide that information, now you have the handle. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes when you go to the credit reporting agency and dispute, you know, you have different other tactics that you want to use to get out specific account. Because when you deal directly with the creditor on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, you tend to get results faster because it's not going through a computer system or anything like that. I always say creditor, we're talking about like the card in this example for the repossession, the auto dealer or the financing company that you were paying that, you know, that, that took that car from you. Now, if they cannot provide, most of the time, once you request that and they realize that they can't provide, then you send a certified letter and everything like that to them, you get, they just remove the information from off your credit file. 
And if they don't remove it from your credit file, you have consumer affairs attorneys out there ready to sue them because they did not comply with that portion of the law. So that's one tactic for um UC for, for, for repossession. All right. Let's talk about collection, which is one of the biggest nemesis, nemesis for a lot of people now. Now, if you have a third party debt collector, just know this. Most of the time, what, what's supposed to happen now? Now you have third party debt collection agency that now they can text you, now they can email you. You know, before they did not, they, they weren't able to do that, but now they can text you and email you. What you are supposed to do, a lot of people, when they, when they get letters and stuff from collection agency, they tend to ignore it. When they get phone calls from collection agency, they tend to ignore it. If you get a phone call from a, a third party debt collector, you want to answer the phone. And when you answer the phone, if, they, you know, first they're going to say, you know, they might say, is this Tyrone, for example? Is this Tyrone? You can say, yes, this is Tyrone. But we are calling because you owe um, Bank of America such and such amount of money. Why are you ready to pay right now? The first thing that you are going to say, very important that you follow this step. You're going to say, I do not discuss debt over the phone. I do not want you to call me. I do not want you to, e no, I do not want you to email me. And I do not want you to text me. Please send to me by snail mail, right? Which on snail mail is basically the post office. Who you are, the amount I owe, and all of that stuff. And then I'll write back to you and let you know if, if I want to continue having this conversation with you, right? So once you mention that to them, okay, you need to document that. You need to actually make sure you put down the date and the time that you, you tell them not to call you, not to text you, and not to email you. To make this stronger, you want to write that same company. So when, when they reach out to you, one of the things I forget to mention is you want to make sure you get the name, the address. You know, you want to know who you're talking to, okay? Now, to make it stronger, you want to just simply write them a letter and, and confirm the conversation. So basically, on this date and this time I spoke to, if the name of the person is, 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 is what, what, let's use somebody's name, it's Nicole. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Nicole. On February 1st, she called me regarding this debt. I have no idea. Even if you know you owe the debt 100%, never admit it. You just make sure you put, I have no idea who this person is. I told him to send me proof that I actually hold this debt in writing. Until they can provide that, they should not call me, communicate with me, and, they should, and, 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 and only communication should be in name. You just want to basically put that in. Once you put that in there, send it off to them, send it off certified mail. You want to keep a file. If that company call you, if that company email you or text you, they are in violation of a law called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. All right? And that is $1,000 right there. Now you have a separate law called the Telephone Collection Practices Act. The TCPA. $1, you mean a $1,000 fine? A $1,000 fine to that company. Mm -hmm. All right? A $1,000 fine. And then obviously, if you can, you know, you can get deeper. But this sometimes a little bit harder. If if they if they start to stress you out and you went to the doctor, you can start to prove that because of them harassing me and all of that stuff. No, I had to go to the doctor and everything like that. But these are some of the things. These are some of the tactics and strategies that we can use. So when it comes down to collection agency, never pay them, never admit anything at all. Because especially third party debt collector that bought the debt from another company. Once you receive that and keep your proper documentation. That is a way that you can start to use or as leverage to get them off your credit report. Because if they are on your credit report, that is part of collection. That is a part of them. That is one of the ways that they are using to try to get the money from you. So if they can't prove that you owe them anything, which is basically an agreement with your signature on it, they're not supposed to be on your credit report either. All right? So the, the, that's one of those strategies. So you're, saying, now, so you're saying once something is in collection, do not pay it. Absolutely not. Don't pay it at all. So what because you got to do is just try to get it off your credit report. What if you want to get it off your credit report? Because the reason why, say that again. What if it doesn't come off? No, if it don't come off, then you're going to sue them. Okay. Right? So this is why you're using those tactics because you're still going to always write in the letter and everything, you know, but it's easier to get an arm a third party debt collector. One of the things that you can do too, you can file complaints with, with um, a government agency called a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You can also file complaints with the attorney general. They don't like that. And right now, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is aggressively going after collection agencies. There are a lot of collection agencies that are being shut down now by, by the Consumer Financial mm -hmm. Protection Bureau. So when you write a letter and they realize that you're an educated consumer, they tend to back off. 
you know one of the easiest things for me to get off of people credit report is collections okay yeah because uh, as, because it's basically kind of hard for them to prove that you own the debt and most of the time what happens is these collection agency buy the debt from the original company and they buy it in bulk and they pay pennies on the dollars for these debt mm -hmm. so these are all electronic transa transaction so when you ask them for proof like send me an agreement it's hard for them to even send you anything. And usually what happens is like when you buy a house, you have to sign all of these papers and that mortgage company can reassign that debt to another company. Right. Right. You, it, you know, with, with your closing document, you sign off giving permission for that to happen. When you get a credit card, if you call up and get a credit card over the phone, you don't sign out any of these papers. So if a collection agency is coming after you, they need to be, be able to show some kind of assignment of contract. You know, with your signature on it. So this is why you never want to pay a third party debt collector. Got all right. Got it. In fact, you can get paid from them a lot because they can keep if they keep calling you and, and keep harassing you. As I mentioned before, once you sue them, that's that's a payday right there, you know? Okay. Um yeah. so here's my question, the practical question. Um do I have two questions? Uh there's a lot of times, you know, people want to buy a house. Or they want to buy a car or even they want to rent an apartment because you know they're asking for credit scores to rent apartments now right um and let's just say the cutoff is 620 credit score uh and you run your credit or they run it and they tell you you've got a 610 right you're just mm -hmm. 10 points away from qualifying mm -hmm. for this house mortgage or for this car or for you know moving into an apartment is someone able to come to you to try to get a quick 10 point boost and if yeah. so and if so you know talk talk about that because all right that's the position a lot of people are in they're just a little bit short to get to what it is that they want and they want to be able to talk to a professional to resolve that issue as quickly as possible so give me in a case like that someone comes to you um what are some of the strategies and of course everyone's case is different but i know that i mean this is your wheelhouse so you kind of see things over and over again and you kind of know i'm sure you have your special moves that can get a credit score up 10 points 15 points 20 points up very quickly um and what's the turnaround time with something like that okay so so um so once again it all depends on what is on the credit report so if somebody comes to me and they just need like 10 points and first of all just to mention to anybody this is why you always want to run your credit yourself because i've had people when they're trying to get get hosted out they were at 620 but because they went to one blender before and then they go to the other they lose points because of the inquiry but anyway but yeah but if somebody comes to me in a situation like that and they just need 10 points right first thing we're going to look on is the credit card if they have credit cards, we want to look at how much the, the bill, um, um, what the balance is on those credit cards, okay? Because if they have a credit card and 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 the balance is thirty percent of the credit limit, then one of the things that we tell them to do is that hey, just pay down that credit card, and that can be thirty points right there. You can, and if the and if and if the, that credit card is going to report in five days, then within five days you can get that points. You know, if if that person says, man, I don't have the money to pay that credit card. They will say, okay, then you have a family member that have like, because if that credit card is a thousand dollar limit, right? And you owe, say you owe five hundred dollars on that credit card. That part, because of that five hundred dollars, that might prevent you from getting that points up. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, you, you know, for some apparent reason, things rough, you just can't find that money. But if you have a friend or a family member and they have a credit card with a five thousand dollar credit limit, right? And they can add you as an authorized user then what it's gonna do now, it's gonna show that on your credit. Now you have $6,000 available to you and just a $500 balance. So now the, the, now the, um, the, the percentage right. is the debt to income ratio change. And then right. once that- Right, you once just that all happens, of a sudden now went to under 10%. Right, and right. that because it, the point. It'll be, it'll be um, let's say that 5,000 plus that 6,000, mm -hmm. 6,000 in credit that you have because someone signed you up as an authorized user, which, by the way, does not affect um, that person's credit card. No, it don't. Um, it does yeah. not affect their credit score at all. And no. I've added people to my uh, mm -hmm. credit card just to help them out to get a better credit score, right? What um, you want to do is just, just to, I'm glad you mentioned that. So if you're adding somebody, so like a city bank, if you're adding them as an authorized user, you just want to make sure that you use your address, because if you put that person's address, 
they can get a credit card and if it's not somebody you're comfortable they can spend right. and then it can affect right. you. so yeah. you always want to make sure if you're adding somebody as an authorized user you always keep your address so that we if right. anything is coming regarding it's come it comes to you and not that person absolutely and that is what i do and when i do add authorized users one of the other things i do is um i do an addition of an authorized user without a card so mm -hmm. there's no card that's issued. They're just added on as an authorized user. So there's no chance for them to ever get a card or to right. spend, spend any money on my card. But what happens is, is that they then get all of the credit history attached with my card. Right. 10 years of great payments and, you know, mm -hmm. a, a low balance and all of that. So they're able to basically inherit all of the good behavior that I've, I've engaged in. And I've done it for several people. And it's helped them out a lot. And so that's a great strategy um, yeah. that people can use, man. If you're 10, 15, 20 points short of what you need to be able to move into an apartment or get a car or get a house, man, just try to find some responsible people in your circle or in your family. Mm -hmm. and you just tell them, you know, can you add me as an authorized user? I don't need to get a card, nothing. I'm not going to spend anything on your card as an authorized user. You just add me. Um, it won't hurt your credit in any way whatsoever, but it will just help my credit. That way you don't have to ask people for a loan, right? right? One of the things is, oh, I need to pay down this credit card to be able to get it reported at a low balance in the next couple of days. Now you got to go with your hand out, ask for right. money and all that. But if you have a brethren or a sister who you're cool with, you can just really call them and it's no risk to them, Right. right. It becomes a it becomes a no risk situation, and that's the type of you know interaction you want with your friends and family. That can you help me out, and it's not a risk to you in any way. Um, you don't have to loan me any money. You don't have to do anything. Just add me as an authorized user on one of your good credit cards, and we're good to go. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know that's very helpful. So you know that's a very that's a very key strategy that folks can use. You know, right? So um, you would go and ahead then that for them, and I know there's some are credit companies, credit repair mm -hmm. companies that actually, they will charge you a little something to add you as an authorized user to one of their accounts. And that's what that's I was going to talk about they, next. Yeah, yeah I that think was, that's what you're going to talk about. Yeah, that's exactly segue. what I was going to. And and I don't do that because what happened is that um, nothing is wrong with doing that. But, you know, as a black man running a credit repair company, we know the government. No, no, that's a whole different type of business. So we, we recommend companies that you can go to and they call it um, trade line, where you can get a trade line. So if somebody don't have anything on the credit, so for example, you want to get that 10 points, right? And you don't have a credit card. And that's one of the quickest way to get to get points. And you can't find anybody in your immediate circle, everybody in the same situation that can add you as an authorized user. Then what you can do, you can purchase a trade line. But you have to be very careful, though, because a lot of these companies, sometimes they sell it to like 10 different people. You get what I'm saying? And then it don't, it, when you put it on your credit report, it don't work, you know? So what you want, and then you want to make sure you, if you're going to get a trade line, you want to know when it's actually going to report. So we have companies that we, we recommend that are decent companies, right? And then what you can do, you basically buy that trade line, you're going to get it added to your credit report probably for like nine months, not nine months, three, 90 days usually, for like three months. And that can help boost your credit, you know? So that's that's one of the other things that we can do. But we recommend companies. I don't sell it or do anything like that. Another thing that you can do too, um, if you're trying to buy a house, right? And it depends on the mortgage banker that you're working with. Now, there are certain mortgage bankers that do this and, and, and some that don't do it. So, for example, if you have a credit card and you have a certain balance on the credit card and you and you went to that mortgage banker and that and they know that it's the balance that's preventing you from getting that score so you can't get pre-qualified for that mortgage, what that mortgage company can do, they can do what you call a rapid rescore. They can put it in their system as if you pay down that credit card, all right? And this is why it's important to build relationship with certain bankers in our community that understand this because they know that, okay, you shot 10 points, but what they'll do, and they know that, okay, let me just put it in the system as if you pay down the credit card, all right? And now that will shoot up the credit score. And they know that by the time you close on the property, when they rerun the credit, you'll already have that balance. If, if you get where I'm coming from. It's that, like, it's like they, they are anticipating you paying it off. Just there you go. So they call that rapid rescoring. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So that's one of the things that, and, and sometimes they don't know it, some mortgage company don't know it, but if, and so if you know, because you're educated about this, that's one of the questions that you can ask them in advance before they run your credit. Just so if you go to my FICO and you know that you need a 620 and you have a 610, okay? Then before, when you go to the mortgage company, then you, you, you let them know that, hey, my middle score is 610. Is this credit card balance that I have? It's not, and, and you, sometimes so you might even pay the balance, but it's not going to report until next month. Mm -hmm. But you want to get this pre because there's a property that you need to close and it's a sweet deal, whatever the reason is. And yeah. You just need to have this um, pre-qualification letter so you can give to the owner right but that balance is not going to reflect until 30 days from now okay you just paid it january yeah. 1st and and it is going to rip the next time it's going to report is the 31st right. so that's if you can find a mortgage banker explain that situation to them and let them know hey i just paid the balance so yes if you run my credit it's, it's, it's gonna ref, it's not gonna reflect it it's gonna show to six then because it's not gonna report until a month then that bank that mortgage company can do what we just spoke about re, re you know rapid rescore Put it in as if you know it's already paid and then they can give it a pre-qualification and you move on with your life you know yeah so these are just some of the, the little situations some of the things that you you um you can do i'm, I'm just trying to think there's so many different ways Heru. <laughs> there's so many different tactics you know that that like usually when i get the credit report and i look at it i can immediately say okay this is what we can do based on what you're trying to do for an inquiry if somebody come because sometimes some people come to me and they're trying to get business loans and they have 750 credit score but they have tons of inquiries so because of that inquiry now they can't get the business. good credit mm -hmm. bills paid credit card balance low but they, when they when they um apply for these business credit cards it's you know the, the um i don't remember the terminology that they use hacking you know they already apply for a lot of different mm. credit cards at the same time. But the inquiries on the personal credit. So because of that, they might have 20, 30 different inquiries, mm. you know. And and some of the inquiries might be a year because the older the inquiries, the less impact it have on your credit score. Okay. And inquiries only stay in your credit report for two years. After two years, it fall off. So don't they know they can't get the business loan? Because if you have, I think if you have like five or six or more inquiries on your credit report. That's going to prevent you. So they have the credit score. They have everything. So what you want to do now, once you see those inquiries now, what they're going to have to do, we know that's okay then. You 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 apply for, and this and, and we need to be very careful here because this, don't, you know, when you dispute, when you're, when you're trying to get rid of um, hard inquiries off your credit report, like, you, you know, you want to make sure that type of, it's not an inquiry that's tied to an open account. Because if it's tied to an open account, then, what they can do is they can like, like if you have a mortgage, if you have a car note, if you have a car note, if you have if you went to the car dealership, and this is when you tend to see a lot of inquiries when people are applying to get a car loan, mm -hmm. that car dealership is shopping around to try and get that. Um, and this is one of the perfect examples. That car dealership is shopping around to different banks to get you the best rate or whatever reason so that you can buy that car. So when you look at your credit report, you might see you have 20 inquiries. Now, the good thing, the, the, and it, it, it only affects you once. So if you went to that car dealership and they run your car, they run your credit report 20 different times, it's only going to affect your credit score once, once you do it within a certain time period. Same thing with a mortgage, mm -hmm. right? It only affects you once. But if you go like every 30 days, then it's going to be a hit every time you go, if you go every 30 days. But if you do all of that transaction within that time, within a 20 to 30 day period, then it's only going to hit your credit once. But the inquiry is going to still show up on your credit report. Mm. So when you go for that business loan, they're going to see all of these inquiries. So what you want to do, if eventually you get the financing with Santander for the auto loan, mm -hmm. then you know that once you start to dispute these inquiries, you cannot dispute the Santander one because they can do what you call, they can accelerate the loan, meaning that they can say, hey, you, you know, if you're saying that, oh, I didn't run my credit card, that's basically what you're going to do. What you're going to do is dispute the inquiry, say, hey, I, I don't remember applying for this, you know? Mm -hmm. That bank, they need to prove that you applied for that card. And most of the time when you go into a car dealership, you don't sign individual agreement with each of these banks. You just sign one agreement. So if that bank can pro provide you with some kind of signature, you asking them to run your credit, you know, so for, say for example, you went to Chase, Chase, you didn't get the car with Chase. You went to Bank of America, you didn't get it with Bank of America, but those are showing up as inquiries. You can dispute that, mm -hmm. right? And they need to provide some kind of documentation as proof to show that, yes, you applied, here's your signature. If they provide it, then they can't take it out. But if they can't provide that, 
then they need to come off your credit report. You see what I'm saying? But the Santander now, if Santander see that you are applying, you're, you're, you're just using this as an example. If Santander see that you're trying to get this inquiry off, if they want, they can say, oh yeah, well no, you need to pay me all the money. You know, because you're, you're disputing, you have the car, so they can either take the car from you because now you're disputing the fact, or they can say, well, no, you have to pay up the balance, the right. entire amount. So that's why you want to be careful and make sure that anybody that you're going to, they know what they're doing. So that's another quick way to, to, to basically, um, to, 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 well, it's not really to get the score up, but you can get the score up. But I was talking in terms of business. I don't know you asked a question about the score. Sometimes yeah. inquiries affect your score, but obviously you can get the score down, but, for, but you can get qualified for that business loan by removing those hard inquiries. So that's one of the um the strategies that that you, that you can use in a situation like that, you know? And that's for inquiries. So um let's get into some of the tell us some of the more um poignant success stories uh that you've had with clients. Yeah, so a lot of success. So I had this this guy come to me because he's a business owner. He has this rehab, this re most of the people that come to me. Um, are people that are trying to purchase home or people that are business are trying to get business loan. So he had a repossession. We use the same strategy where we use the UCC law, asking them to provide the proof that repossession for, was for $40,000. They weren't able to provide that documentation, so they removed it from the credit file. We had a gentleman come to me, bankruptcy. He took out a, um, his, 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 um, his he, what do you call that? He co-signed for for um for his sister for a mortgage, right? Now reach a certain situation where the sister wasn't paying the mortgage, and in order to try to save the house, she had to file for bankruptcy. So because his name was on the doc the documentation, right? He ended up having a bankruptcy on his credit report, mm -hmm. even though he wasn't living at the house. So what we were able to do so, and obviously he wanted the bankruptcy off. So what I was able to do is, this is where the FCRA come into play. What, what, what you think was the error on that credit report? Remember, he wasn't living at that house. He has a different address. Her house is in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He lives in New York. So on that filing paperwork, they have him living in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So the way that he's reporting now, they have a New Jersey address reporting on his credit report. All right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we disputed the person, we went into the personal information. And then what a lot of, I, I want people to understand is sometimes when you're disputing, very, the personal information is tied to, because how the personal information get on your credit report, a lot of times people ignore the personal information, but that's a really very good tactic that you can use, right? The personal information is tied to whatever negative information is on his credit report. So he, the New Jersey address was reporting on his credit report. He never lived in New Jersey. So all we did was disputed the address, the New Jersey address. And because he, they can't prove it, he wasn't living there, they removed that, the bankruptcy automatically was deleted. All right? Right, no. basically you're saying, that's not me. That's right. another person at another address because I've never lived right. there. So it you must never... be some type of fraud. Someone, there you go. My, my address, and they, they just put something in my name and that address, and there's no evidence that I've ever lived there. He never signed for anything. He never right. knew all of that. She did all of that. Right. <laughs> so those are some of the, another very important strategy that people in our community can use. This is a powerful one. Now, a lot of us as Black people, when we come conscious, we decide that we want to change our name legally, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a government name, whatever name your parents give you, and, you know, you were young, you run up all of these negative accounts and all of these stuff, Right. And you have all these repossession, all these negative stuff on your credit reports. And you do everything and you try to get rid of it. Now, now that you, you decide that, okay, I'm going to change my name legally with the system and everything like that, okay? Once you get a different, you change your name tied to your social security, all of that stuff. Because, you know, obviously you're going to change it, your old name to your new name, but you're going to keep the same social security number, right? What's going to happen is when they run your credit, two people are going to show up with that social security number. You're gonna have the old you with the old name with all mm -hmm. of those negative information. And then you're gonna have the new you 
right? And it's not supposed to happen because it's, it's like you just come in the country, if that makes sense, okay? Yeah. But a lot of times what happened, because the social security have all the negative and all the errors and everything like that, if it have all of these accounts. So once you look at the credit report, you look into the personal information section, all right? You're going to have, your, it, it depends on what you're doing. But I always tell people to do, once you get that new name, once you have, that, when I say, you know, you change your name, you want to start to get a call, like get a phone bill or something in that name. Make sure your driver's license, your social, your picture ID is in your new name, all right? And then once you pull that credit report, now and it have all of these mess on it, you can write to the credit reporting agency and say, I recently pulled a copy of my credit report and yeah. I noticed there are duplicates, okay? And then you're yeah. sending your driver's license with your, you know, your, your name, your social security, you send all your proof. And once you send all your proof, because the credit report, you have so many people with different names, you might have a junior, senior, yeah. you know, somebody. So because of that, no, that's one of the quickest way to get your credit result because now they're going to just go in and they're just going to totally wipe that file and you know, whenever you go, whenever you um pull your, you know, putting your new name, that negative information is it shouldn't show up anymore. Because that was an error. You make them aware of it. Right. So that's one of the strategies I always tell people. You have a lot of Muslims when they change their name to, you know, last name to Muhammad, stuff like that. Try don't don't put if you got to do that. The, 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 you know, you always don't put the old bills. If you were if you had a credit card and, and you had some late payments and stuff right. like that, you want to be careful. Do not change over the name. Right. You get what I'm saying? Keep that old. Yeah. Now. Right. Keep Unless it's a history. positive account. Yeah. If it's a if it's a positive account, right. then obviously, then you can just, you know, you can call the bank and do whatever. But if it's negative, leave it at in the old name and you right. start fresh. Right. All right. right? So these oh. are some of the little stuff. As I said, there are so many different strategies and stuff that we can do, you know, that you can do. But that's some of the ways that we have a lot of people. And I've helped a lot of people that change the name to okay. fix it. Because so, one of the things that one of, sorry, one of the things that you can do to quickly, because once you get that name, you can also to quickly build up your credit. If you have somebody that pay the bill, they can add your name as an authorized user. But now they're putting your new name. You see what I'm saying? Right. So now you're building credit, and that will make it start to once you get that credit card showing up on your credit report, then you can start to, be, to apply for credit. Because a lot of times, if you apply for credit with nothing in your credit report, you're not gonna get anything. Right. You know. But once you add at least one account and you get that credit score, now you can start to apply for stuff, positive stuff in that new name. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, um, the case that you had with the um, bankruptcy um, and the $40,000, how long did it take you to resolve that issue? For, okay, so the case with the, um, the bankruptcy, it took, with the repossession, that took a little bit. That took about four months, all right, to resolve. Because what happened is that when we write the letter initially to them, Right, they, they they responded with a bunch of paperwork, you know, signature and all of these stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So once they responded with that, no, you have to respond to them stating that you did not send the proof. So if ultimately they did not want to remove it, but one of the things, remember, I told you I worked with an attorney, right? Mm -hmm. So because I work with this attorney now, I was able to put that attorney's name on the bottom of the letter, the CC. So once they saw that. They realize that okay, this is somebody that's not playing game, you know. So then I was able to get that off. So that's why it happened. But sometimes with that particular case, it took about four months because they, that that was one of the harder ones, you know. They wouldn't budge. With the bankruptcy, now that took longer. That took six months. The reason yeah. why no, that was the address because there was two different bankruptcy. The bankruptcy was actually quicker. That one was done within like two months. All right, because because it came off because of the address. Because mm. once we once we did the person and that don't work all the time. I should let everybody know this. You know, I'm not gonna come in and you know these are strategies. Sometimes it works. This is why you want to do legal disputes at all times. So if it don't work, you can go after them in the end. So that worked when we dispute the address. Once I remove the address, within because the credit reporting agency have thirty days to respond. All right. Mm -hmm. So that the road, you know, once we did that, the first thirty days when they send the letter, which is around forty five, they, they didn't take it off. We sent a follow-up letter. Once we did that, it came off, you know, because they ignored the first letter. But if if it did not come off, if there sometimes they will remove the address and, the, and that negative, the bankruptcy might still remain there, right? This is where you're going to want to dispute. Now, with bankruptcy, there are other strategies, right? Because what happened is that bankrupt, the, 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 you have three major credit reporting agencies, and the courts 
they don't get these information from the court. You have a bigger company called Alexis, Nexus, CoreLogic. These third, these, these smaller credit reporting agency, they go out there and get that information from the courts. All right. And then now the bigger companies, which are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, they get that information from the Lexis Nexus. So usually, if the person, if when you try to do the personal information portion don't work, then you want to go after those these little smaller companies first and get it and dispute it with them so that by the time you get around to the bigger companies when they go to go, go over to the smaller companies there's no bankruptcy there and ultimately they have to remove it you get what i'm saying yeah so that take a little bit longer because you have to go to this first you have to you know you have to go to the bigger companies first you have to download make sure you have the actual um documents you, you have a you have a website called pacer which which a lot of that's that's a lot of attorney. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, pacer.com. That's what a lot of attorneys use when they want to look up cases, you know, mm -hmm. old cases and stuff like that. So we so we use that to download so we download the bankruptcy from Pacer to make sure we look okay. at when it was filed. And then now we request a credit report from the smaller credit reporting agency and we compare the information. Usually it's off that is on the bank the 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 the, 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 um, the actual filing and, and the and the information that the smaller companies have, and they would dispute it with the smaller companies. And you tend to get results quicker from the smaller companies because they're not as big as the bigger company, and a lot of people are not disputing with them. So when you when you do legal dispute to them, they tend to get shaken up a little bit and respond quicker. But that took a little while because it was reporting on more that, and I wasn't sure. Sometimes, you know, like for example, TransUnion Equifax go to Lexis Nexus. And TransUnion go to a new company now. I don't remember the name because it just yeah. come out another um collection, smaller collection agency. Sometimes you have to try to figure out which one of these collection agency these bigger companies are going to. So they have to dispute it with more than one. So that so that way you now once you get it off from the smaller company, once you go back to the the bigger company, the big three, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, we know that they're gonna try and verify it with a smaller company, but when they try to do that, there's not gonna be any bankruptcy there because you already disputed with them. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. So that's why it can take a little bit longer for bankruptcy. But it shouldn't pass six months though. Okay. If you can't get it off within six months, you need to start suing. Yeah, that's major to be able to get a bankruptcy off of your uh credit mm -hmm. report. That's major. Yeah, it's a big, big deal. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but we do that all. That's something that it's because yeah, every 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 negative information of a specific step and procedure, you know, and that's that's it with bankruptcy. And then the good thing about it, so I work with attorneys that go to court and sue. Because sometimes, a lot of times, some it depends on the judge that you're you're, you're going with. You know what I mean? Some you know you, you have to look on old cases and see, you know based on um that that I guess I call it case law. So the attorney that we uh, every week I'm in a class with a consumer attorney, all right, and you can anybody can check him out. Brian Panda that is a brother, you know, and this that's all he does. He used to have a, he, all he does is sue credit repair companies, sue collection agency. So 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 because of that, now every week when we sit down, we ask questions. He comes up with different strategies based on what's working in court. So once you send these letters, a lot of times they realize that oh, you know, especially if it's a company. Like, for example, if it's a company like a Santander, like recently Santander had a class action lawsuit file against them, you know, but companies like those that, that already been to court, once you start to write certain letters, they know that, you know what, I don't want to go down this road. And they'll, they'll quickly remove this stuff from off your credit. And basically, they notify the credit reporting agency to remove it from off your credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent, man. Um, you're doing great work, man. Uh, so how does it usually work for your for your customers and your clients, do they have to pay you like one lump sum or do they pay you every month? Because that no, so what would happen overnight. Right. So because we have to comply with the law right now, because everything, you have a law called the Credit Repair Organization Act, right? That governs credit restoration company. What we do, we charge an initial fee, okay? And that initial fee basically cover what you call a deep credit analysis. We have to review the credit see what the errors are, identify what, once we identify all the errors, you pay for that, okay? Then now, you only pay when the information come off your credit. So if we, if we don't get, we don't charge monthly. So you're not gonna, so, so we are incentivized to get that credit fixed as soon as possible so we can get the rest of our money, you know? 
So basically, it's a paper delete model. Oh, so, so, once, so, you, so you get paid based on performance. Based on performance. Yeah, that's, and a, this great, is always, that's a great structure that you have. Yeah. Because a lot of these other credit repair places, you know, you don't know the results you're going to get from them, but there they have to pay a monthly fee. Right. So no, it's been, so we, we have to be successful. And because and we have people that we have staff. So because they want the money, they're going to go aggressively. They're not going to try to lengthen it out, you of know, course. to try to keep you on a program for nine, six months, you know? Yeah. And then it work out better too. The quicker you fix somebody credit, guess what you're going to get? Referrals. Yeah, you're going to get more <laughs> referrals. Man. Yeah. So, so that, so that's how, so that's basically what we've been doing. You know, so it's a paper delete model. Nice, man. And does it matter? If I know you're you're out of New York, right? Um, yes. Customers can come to you anywhere in the United States. They don't have to be New York based, right? No, they just can't come from Georgia. I can't take anybody from Georgia. Georgia, and, and because Georgia is strong against credit repair, so unfortunately, what I'm working on now, though, is I'm doing a um, um, it's not out yet, but I'm doing a um coaching program. So we're 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 so. That's a different level now, you know? So, mm -hmm. and the coaching program basically is, you know, me, everything that I do, I'm basically just telling you how to do it yourself. And I know a lot of people, you know, we have a lot of business people out here that don't have the time to sit down and write letters and all of that. Then we have, um, we, we work, we're going to be partnering up with an outsourcing company. When I say outsourcing company, a staffing company that basically, when you purchase the, the course, instead of you going through the course, you can hire this personal assistant to do go through the course for you and, and, and do the credit repair. But this is how I stay compliant. And then that's how we'll be able to help people in the state of Georgia because I am not doing credit repair. I'm just selling you a course on how to do the credit repair. Whatever you do with it, it's up to you. So, so you know, you just I, I don't I'm just selling you the information. So so and then now you now have to go through and do the work yourself. But as I said, mm -hmm. I tried that before in the past, but most people they're busy. You know, I mean, people don't have the time to sit down and write letters and wait and, you know. So this is why now we, we, we're still in the works, partnering up with the staffing company now for them to do the work for you. But that's a staffing company. It's like you hire a personal assistant to pick up your dry cleaners, make some phone calls for you. They're just writing letters to the credit report agency on your behalf. And you can hire them for anything else if you're a business owner. But if you're not a business owner, you know, you can't have them do anything. So that's what I'm working on now. So that when I do that, then I'll be able to take on clients in in Georgia. Okay. Um, so that's just Georgia, but the rest of the America, yes. the rest yes. of America, you can take people. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. now the other side too, is, is that do you have like a team together? And what I mean by that is, is that if I'm interested in getting a mortgage, mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that in, this is the business that you're in, I'm sure you have a lot of relationship with mortgage bankers and mortgage companies and auto loan companies and what have you. If I come to you, would you also be able to give me some type of reference to a mortgage company? Definitely, definitely. I have, um, yeah, I have a mortgage guy that I work with right now. I think you might know him too, you know? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. My brother, son, Jada. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you'd be able to refer people out. And uh, because of the fact that you have those relationships, basically people would be able to reverse engineer their success because definitely. the mortgage guy would tell you exactly what's needed and then you'd be able to work with the person to be able to reverse engineer so that their numbers come out there you exactly go. what he needs it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I definitely work with the because the whole goal of me doing your credit, you know, because I know a lot of people like to walk around and they like to brag, oh, I have an 800 credit score, I have a 750 credit score, but what are you doing with it? Are you using it to leverage to gain asset to put back money in your pocket? Just what you have people that have the, the credit rich, but the poor, if you get what I'm saying, they live in hand, you know, when you can use this credit to acquire assets, you right. know, get rental property, you know, get do investment. So, so yes, yeah, so that's my whole goal is that when you come to me, yes, I fix your credit, but we want you, and this is why we ask you, what is your end goal? What are you trying to do? You know, because once we fix, our goal here is to fix your credit so you can achieve that goal. So this is why when you come to me now, if you have nine negative information and you're trying to get a mortgage, Right. And it's just three because of the relationship that I have with these mortgage company. I know that it's only three accounts. Like if you have a charge off account, right? And it's been on your credit report for two years. The mortgage company don't care about that. You can still get the mortgage with that, even if the charge off have a, a $10,000 balance in it. 
So then why should I focus on trying to put in my energy on that? What the mortgage company care about is a collection account. Because once that banker put that charge off account on your credit report, if you live in the state of New York, for example, after three years, right, the status of limitation, they can come after you. So if there's a collection account and an or, or account on your credit report and it passes the statute of limitation, that banker know that he don't have to worry about or she don't have to worry about you paying your mortgage because that company can't sue you because it passes such a limitation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of bankers, what they explain to me, they are looking at accounts like if you know if, if you just became delinquent on an account, right? Then they know that this annoying collection agency, if it's within the statute of limitation, mm -hmm. the, even when you have in the house, they can they can file a lawsuit against you. And now that's money that you're gonna have to pay and right. that can take away from that mortgage company receiving, you know, affect your mm -hmm. finances. So, the, so, so, the, so then the bank are going to come to me and say, and I know that automatically because of a relationship. So if you have three collection accounts, the statute of limitation, so for example, in Florida, is five years and you get in the house in five in Florida, then we know that and, 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 yeah, and the debt is on your credit report for like four years and we know that we have to focus on that debt, right. you know, because the debt. So, so the, and, and if the other one is past the five-year mark or if it's a, um, a, a repossession or if it's a, then we know we don't have to worry because sometimes what happens is that Bank of America might decide that, okay, they sell the debt to the third party debt collector. So now Bank of America don't own that debt anymore, but it's still showing up on your credit report negatively. We don't have to focus on the Bank of America because they pass it on to the collection agency. We just focus on the collection agency. Problem is that a lot of credit repair company, and this is where the monthly thing come into play now, because they want to get that money from you, they're going to keep you on the program and say, hey, you know, and they keep, you keep, and for nine months, 12 months, you keep trying to, because they're trying to get rid of every single negative information on your credit, you know? Right, so right. this is why I educate people and say, listen, you want to focus, it's a different credit system we're living right now. I right. know it don't look pretty, and you're, oh, I just want to have a squeaky clean credit report. It doesn't matter, you can get an 800 credit score with, with negative information on your credit. I know that because I see it all the time, you know? Right. I have so that. So I mean, this is what I this is what I love about your payment structure for customers, and I, I hope that the listeners and the watchers are paying attention. So let me just tell you my story. So when I decided to clean up my credit, it was over a decade ago, and I was living uh, kind of off grid. Uh, I was an artist, and I was like, you know, burning a fire on everything, and so right. cards I wasn't paying them back. I wasn't, you know. So it affected my credit score. And as you become an adult, you become a man, you start getting responsibilities and having good credit is important within the American system. And you can also leverage it to build wealth. So I saw that it was important to do it. So I did hire a credit company and this was over a decade. This is way before I met you. So I, mm -hmm. had, I think it was called Sky Blue or Blue Sky. I'm familiar and, with um, them. Yeah. So they had me on a monthly payment. You know, yeah. um, and it took about nine months, exactly is what you said. But the, the listeners and watchers, please, please pay attention to what the brother's saying. There are certain things that are on your credit report that have a statute of limitations. So, for instance, I made a, I might have had my score lowered because I had 10 inquiries. Mm -hmm. And those inquiries might have happened a year and a half ago. Right. But as the brother just said they could only be in your account for two years. Two years. Right? right? But guess what happened? If I paid Sky Blue and it's already one and a half years in and they've got me on nine months, I'm unnecessarily paying them for work that was going to be taken off of my account. Anyway. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Right? So I only had six months left, but they're billing me for nine months. And that at that six-month mark, I would have hit two years on those inquiries and they would have been removed for free. But right. paying Sky Blue or any of these companies, because they're basically just charging me every month, regardless mm -hmm. of whatever the results are. And I see it come off of my report and I don't know any better. And I'm thinking Sky Blue did it. If Sky Blue didn't do it. It was actually, you know, the statute of limitations had run out. So there you go. Um, your way of doing it is better is that you're charging people based on results that you basically get for them. And I think that that's the best way to do it. And that's why Definitely. you know, I wanted to make people aware of your business offerings because a lot of people are being, even in this whole credit thing, people don't know what they don't know, but they're being right. charged. They're being charged for non-performance, right? right. They're charged yeah. every month. And all a guy did was yeah. send out two letters and you're yeah. being charged and there's been no reply to the letters yet. And then next month, 
there's been no reply, but you're being charged. So right. the way you're doing it is if I get these items off and I did it, then then you pay me. So that, that I mean, that, that's a much better way to do business for the customer and for the consumer. And I would imagine that if they just knew, they would all come to you instead of these other credit card, you know, uh, right. uh, credit reporting, uh, fixing agencies, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I want people to know that there's a there's a competitive advantage of going with Brother Tyrone because he's only asking you to pay him for the work that he did and the success that he gets for you. And that's quite different than most of these other companies. You got to pay them irrespective of whatever their results are. So I'd mm -hmm. like to applaud you for having that type of a business model. Definitely. And then just to let everybody know, too, I didn't even mention this because I'm talking, you know, I am going to, if you're in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area, Saturday, January 13th, I'm going to be at Everlasting Life Vegan Restaurant. Very excited about this presentation. We're going to be talking about stuff like this, you know, and it's going to be broadcast virtually. So if you're not able to attend in person, mm -hmm. you'll be able to watch, you know, you'll be able to attend by Zoom. So, mm -hmm. you know, go to goodcreditblueprint.com, register right there, and you can get the information to show up at this seminar. It's going to be very powerful. When I do my seminar, Obviously, it's for Black people, and I do my thing differently because we always like to talk about the history of credit as it pertains to us as a people. Because a lot of times we like to beat up ourselves, and we have to realize that this whole credit system, when it was designed, it was designed to keep us down. That's the bottom line. So we're going to talk about the history of credit and then talk and show us how we can use it. So give me, you know, give so, so let me just stop you there. Um, mm -hmm. Well, before I start, let me just tell you, let people know that um, it's it's Everlasting Life, E-Life Restaurant and Lecture Hall. So don't think okay. it's going to be like a restaurant and Brother Tyrone's just going to be speaking and it's like a restaurant and people know it's actually a lecture hall that holds, you know, a couple hundred people. So that's where mm -hmm. he'd be doing it. So it's going to be very professionally done. It's going to, you know, you're going to have a lot of space to sit. There will be, you know, tables. There will be an opportunity for you to take notes and all of that and, you know, video presentation, all that. So um, just let people know this is definitely more than a restaurant. It's going to be a lecture hall where, you know, Tyrone is going to be, you know, really giving it up to people in terms of the information. Now, uh, as far as the lecture goes, and I think I was going to ask you something about something you just said. Um, about it. You just said something. I forgot exactly. I, I wanted to let people know about the lecture hall, that it's more than a restaurant. But then there was something that you said. I was talking about the history of credit as it yes, pertains. that's what um, it is. That's what I wanted to ask you. So can you give us, you said you made a, you know, a very provocative statement that credit was all about us um, in terms of uh, black folks in America. Can you give an example as to how credit was about keeping black folks outside of the financial market? So basically when, when, when this whole credit system really come into play, this was way back into, you know, um, right after slavery so basically right after slavery we as black people were considered three-fifths of a human you know what i mean so basically so we couldn't get to participate in the credit system as you would have want to participate in the credit system so the credit system coming to play after world war ii basically what happened is that um a lot of there, there wasn't any real money circling circulating around in the economy you know so in order for us to get goods when i say us i'm talking about the people generally the people that live in the united states of america in order for them to purchase goods and services they had to credit it so they would go to these different you know merchants and everything like that and, and and credit these goods and then what these merchants would do they would keep records it's like, you know, if that person got to buy, buy, buy a specific product or services, they'll keep a record. And if that person paid the bills on time, the next time they come back, they'll be able to get that goods and services. All right. Now, we as individuals, we weren't able to get that credit because most of these companies that was issuing that credit were um were 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 were, were white folks. You know what I mean? These are they were former slave owners and everything like that. These were the guys that was issuing in the credit. And then as I said, right after slavery, we as a people we participated with that. A lot of us move out, move from down south, and some of us end up um um getting involved in the share crops, share cropping system. Now as we know about segregation, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with segregation and everything like that. 
This is what forced us because while the banks was issuing money and 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 the other thing that they call, I'm, I'm sure anybody, and this is something we're gonna get into in more detail, we're talking about like redlining, when um the government give a certain amount of money to 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 um to to, to Americans where they can buy homes and everything. And this is just the pump money in the economy. They do like what you, they do, they, they, they have a thing, they call it redlining where they said the black folks, people in certain neighborhood weren't able to get access to these money. All right. So this is where now we know as people, we, 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 we were forced to basically create our own credit system, you know. So this is where you have the Tulsa, you know, Black Wall Street, all of that, because we couldn't participate in their system. We had to create it for ourselves, right? But the reason why I'm saying that the credit, so that is how we were segregated and kept out of the credit system purposely. And eventually, once they created the credit scoring system, that was supposed to be a way when that credit scoring system to say it's not based on race and everything, but it's based on credit history. So if you don't have any credit, you're not going to be able to get anything. So even if somebody, so for example, you don't have any credit at all, you don't pay, you, don't, you only use cash for everything. If you go to a mortgage company to try to get a house, they're going to laugh at you. Because you don't, you have no credit, so they're not gonna give you a mortgage if they don't know how you handle your bills. So that's kind of what the situation was for black folks. You know, by the time they have this whole system, there was nothing to grade us on. Okay, but what I'm saying now, uh, what I'm gonna explain now. So that's 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 how we weren't able to participate. But what I'm saying now that we're able to we understand the credit system, right? One of the things that happened to us as a people, because we never participated in the credit system, we were the one that financed our business. We were the one that financed our home. So when these people come in, and I'm talking about, you know, Amer white Americans and white folks who are bomb us and, and do all of that stuff, the banks didn't care, the government didn't care. But if you have your house now, and this is where a lot of people say, I like to pay cash. You live in America and you buy a house. You're paying that mortgage to that bank, right? Yes, you have insurance and everything, but this insurance is a white company. We at the time when we during, during um, Black Wall Street, we had our own insurance company. Nobody was coming to us. Everything was we were doing ourselves. But in this economy now, if you're gonna get insurance, it's a white company. Mortgage most mortgage companies are white banker. So you think that these guys gonna come in and bomb that bank? Are you get where I'm coming from? Because part because there's there is like a partnership now, kind of. So this is what I'm saying now, the power of credit now, because you understand credit, yes, you want to get these stuff and everything like that. But you have, to me, as a, as a black person, now you have a little bit more leverage, you know, if you use it the right way, because you know that these people, yes, I mean, they, they're not going to just come in and, and because and, I know a lot of people kind of say, oh, I don't want to get this stuff, because that's what a lot of people said to me, you know, because... What they're going to do is they're going to come in and they're going to say, I don't want to own a house or nothing like that because they're just going to do like what they do. I'm saying, do, do what they do during Black Wall Street and all of that stuff. So I'm like, no, it's a little bit different now because now that they are the ones giving you this money, you know what I mean? They're not, they're, they're going to, it's, it's an asset for them. Are you paying them every month? You know? So that's, so that's basically what I'm going to talk about, how to use the credit system. Because my goal is for all of us as black people to understand the credit get the good credit score and this is why earlier when we were talking we want to kind of move it away from the personal to business mm -hmm. so that for example if you have 10 l's 10 corporations with different credit if one corporation can handle it and you file for bankruptcy that's fine you have nine of them that's still going you know so once we can do that now we pull that money together then that's when now we as individuals can use their money and we invest and we create our own banking system you know what I mean? So that's getting too deep now and everything. But that's the long-term vision I have because you are getting the money from here and then you are buying other assets and and and, and um somewhere else. I almost said somewhere else. Well, I was gonna talk about Africa. I'm a Garveyite. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we know Marcus Garvey, yes, while he was here in the United States of America, he had the the doll factory, he had all of these factories, but the whole goal was to go to Africa and build up Africa. Right? So oh, even yeah. though he was here with all the assets and everything, that was gonna be the leverage. To pump the money and build up the continent so we kind of just need to go back to that same mindset as, a, as black people we don't want to spend everything here and build up this united states of america yes get the assets and all of that but just know that the whole goal is to re as a individual pull that money over but instead of using your own money they use their system as leverage to get that was that clear was that all over the place you think everybody get <laughs> no man and you know that's the type of time i'm on man and that's what i'm yeah. doing um and i've it's been a mantra of mine that, you know, gather resources in America, 
transfer it to Africa and build Africa. There we go. That's that's it. I mean, it's like it's it's a very easy formula. So it's like even with the credit cards, and I think we could probably do another interview as you know, the audience that I have is you know, become more familiar with you, we can have another interview where we can go over like that particular play step right. by step. And, right. You know, what I use is these um, one year or one and a half year uh, no interest credit cards, right? Because basically the interest kicks in, you know, 15, 18 months later, or a year later. And within that year, you're able to then accumulate capital to pay off whatever you used for the credit card. So, so you, do it. you do it, you know, with business credit cards, you rinse and repeat and the dollar stretches much more in Africa. So you're able to buy land, you're able to set up businesses, you're able to do a lot of things with the capital from America. And to me, that is, to me, the most active and the most realistic form of reparations that you can take yes, sir. yourself instead of waiting for other people to give you reparations, use the system here, use the cash here to go ahead and build assets in Africa and have a life in Africa. And that's what I've been doing. So, um, you know, I would love to have that conversation with you at some time and we can, you know, share with the people what the game plan is, but it's a very practical game plan. And if you definitely um, keep on top of your credit score and you're disciplined, you can get access to, I mean, a quarter to half a million dollars within a few years, you can add yeah. half a million dollars in capital mm -hmm. in the form of credit cards to you know run different business plays with so definitely um i think that it is uh something that is in due time the time has come for us to really be talking about those things on a serious level so to uh -huh. have someone like you who's a professional with that and, and guess what listeners and watchers let's say something goes wrong and you get a bad report on your card for trying to do these plays well call tyrone and try to get those bad marks off of your car and then keep on doing what you're doing because definitely um, some of us we have goals in life and what mm -hmm. is stopping a lot of us from achieving these goals in life is a uh, lack of access to capital yeah, well that's that's america is all about access to capital and you know as quiet as kept for those who don't travel america is actually the easiest place to access capital yeah you know in other countries you don't have these credit cards offers and credit card deals and mm -hmm. the ability to get access to ten thousand dollars liquid with one credit mm -hmm. card where you don't have to pay any interest payments for 18 months mm -hmm. um, this is a big deal and so if you have access to the american markets and uh credit card system of america if you're wise and you understand the rules and that's why someone like tyrone is important he understands the rules you cannot play financial chess if you do not understand the rules of chess. Right. Right. You would just be out for the slaughter. You don't know which direction the pawn is supposed right. to move. You don't know what, how the, the, the knight moves, the rook moves, how the bishop moves. You don't mm -hmm. know any of this, but you want to be on the chessboard. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Tyrone to me is like the, a financial chess coach because there's nobody who's made significant money in the world without leveraging credit definitely yeah it's 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 impossible mm -hmm. unless you won the lottery or something but even then you want to be able to leverage credit because right even if you got 10 million dollars in the lottery i'm sure you don't want to buy a million dollars dollar house with cash mm -hmm. you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying you want to be able to save some of that money and reinvest it into other things that's going to give you a 10x growth so mm -hmm. that's why people do mortgages is because you know you pay a little bit at a time so right that money to um, actually grow whatever pile of money you actually do have. So, yeah. um, you know, these are all strategic things and these are all very necessary conversations uh, for us to have, particularly men to have. If you're going to be the main bre breadwinners of your household, you need to understand how you can use credit to further what you're doing along. And um, these are very necessary conversations, man. And I think that you know, we are going to be due for a follow-up conversation in a couple of where we can start talking about different types of strategies. But I think that this was a good introductory interview as to what you do. Can you give your contact information again? And then we can start to close out with yeah. final words to people. 
Yeah. And then basically, if any, you know, just a reminder that I'm going to be in um, the Washington, D.C. area. But if anybody want to reach out to me directly, you can just go to blackpeoplecredit.com, right? Just go to blackpeoplecredit.com, fill out that form, schedule an appointment. Mm -hmm. And, you, and just so when, I will have, you know, on the bottom, okay. uh, in terms of the uh, description of this video, when I put nice. it online, I'll have your, your link to your website and everything. But just cool. in case it's black people credit or black people's credit. Black people, no okay. S. No S, yeah, blackpeoplecredit.com. Black That's yeah. how I can reach you. Yeah, blackpeoplecredit.com. And what you're going to get is access to my calendar. So if you have any kind of credit situation, the first thing we always do, obviously, we need to look at your credit first and see what's going on, you know? So, so and that's the, the initial step. Go to blackpeoplecredit.com. You're going to get access to my calendar. You schedule an appointment, and then we we'll go from there, all right? And then for those people that's interested in attending the seminar, that's goodcreditblueprint.com. And there you go right there, register for, this, for the virtual and the live. All right, and then we're gonna be doing that presentation, okay? And um, if anybody wanna call, you can reach, you, the phone number you can call to make an appointment to is 1-877-900-1454. 1-877-900-1454. My company is called, me and my wife's company, is Asar Capri and Associates, LLC. That's the name of the company, okay? So once you call, you're gonna get um, if you hear, you know, the auto dialer say, thank you for calling us, I can pray and associates, you have the right, no, you have the right, um, please, 1-877-900-1454. But it's best to just go to blackpeoplecredit.com and schedule that appointment if you, if you want to get in contact with me. That's the best way. Excellent. And if somebody's watching and they're not black, and they're Indian and Chinese, you can still go to blackpeoplecredit.com. They can still go to blackpeoplecredit.com. Yeah, you can go you there. Know, and, you know, but you can go there the strategy... and still get, still get, you know, the services from the brother. Um, and don't take a mm -hmm. note because we go to um, Chinatown and mm -hmm. we, we buy things in Chinatown with Chinese. There you go. We can't even read. So it's okay. You can go to Black People Credit and also get the services that uh, brother uh, Tyrone have, whether you're Black mm -hmm. or not. But um, I know that he has a specific focus for us because of the very specific and peculiar history that we have in this country. And someone needs to pay special attention to um, a group of people who've been disenfranchised. Definitely. Um, he'll know the story a lot better than someone else. He'll know the challenges that people are facing and some of the pitfalls. And so that's why you have to have a credit agency that speaks to some of the cultural values and the cultural history that the people have. So. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I salute you for making that a focus in, in, in your work as well. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And I thank you very much for having me on. This was, I can't believe the time because it seemed like you, you know, we just flow. And I'm yeah, like, man. what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm man. Yeah, man. yeah. And I like to, you know, I like to take our time because there's a lot of information and mm -hmm. I don't want it to be rushed. A lot of times. Yeah. People like you get an opportunity to speak. They give you sound bites. Right. That's exactly um, what happened. And you know? I want to make sure that we go in depth and give examples and some of the success stories so people can visualize yeah. it. Um, it's very important. That's why I do these long form interviews. Right. And just to let people know too, sorry to cut you too, because even though I just that was just two success stories off the top of my head, I have a lot. So even the gentleman here that talk about it, we actually have him on video talking about his experience you know what i mean i have people that purchase their home they're in the home with their children so i do you know once you come to me and you actually need to see it i can present it to you i have a young lady that had over six thousand dollars in in um collection debt and she couldn't and she went to court and won her case you know so these are some of the the, the things that they, that they had to take it off her credit report so there's a lot of success stories all right all right, man. Yeah. Beautiful. We've been man. doing this since 2007. So this is not something that I'm right. doing as a hobby. I don't have another job. I do this full time. This is how I feed my family. So I've been so you know, this is what we do. All right. So I just yeah, wanted man. to make that clear to people. This is not a side gig. This right. is actually a career. Yeah, man. Well, we give thanks to your expertise, man. And I have um we give thanks for your expertise. And I have benefited tremendously. And knowing you in the, you know, one year that we've known each other, uh, your advice, your coaching, your presentations has helped me to be able to increase my credit portfolio, uh, I think, by 3x. Wow. So I want to I want to thank you personally 
for you know a lot of the uh, information that you've given to myself and you know a couple other uh, brothers that we know as well. So um, I had to make the world know about you through my platform, man. And uh, we and should love that. I look forward to having you on again, and we can start you know discussing some other you know strategies now that people are acclimated to what you do. We can start looking at you know let's just say like real life situations like you know tyrone there's an offer that i have to buy maybe a couple acres of land in rwanda it's gonna cost mm -hmm. fifteen thousand dollars i'd like to be able to leverage my credit to do that what mm -hmm. do you think i should go about it those types of plays like that where Ready we to can talk about those things you know yeah so um you know i'd like to do those types of exercises with you i think it'd be fun and i think it'd yeah. be formative for people so brother tyrone i'd like to say salute to you thank you thank you for yeah, all man, give thanks you know yeah man thank you for all the good work that you do man and i look forward to doing part two with you in the near future me too and then just hope everybody you know take some action because give out a lot of information people say you're the greatest so you get all but they don't use the information so i'm hoping that whatever information i provide to you you actually put it into action what, what what gives me joy is when somebody actually use the information and say, hey, I paid down the credit card and my credit score went up or I did what you said. That's the greatest compliment you can pay me when you actually do it and it worked for you. So that's what I'm asking everybody to do. That just, you know, give me the accolades and say he's smart, you know what he's doing. I want you to put whatever I'm saying into action and then get the results. And then once you come back to me, yeah, that's 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 when I'll pat myself on the shoulder. All right, man. Yeah, man. Big yeah, up, thanks, man. Kid. Thank you again. Big All right. Up, man. Next time we'll, we'll talk about some reggae music, man. You know? I have to. Yeah, have man. to. You know, I was an artist myself, too. Oh, okay. I never know that. Okay. Yeah, man. What was your, what was your artist's name? But, but, well, when I say artist, I mean, I, I didn't, I was like out there, but the artist's name was um Tigo Massive, but but mm -hmm. but I didn't get to put myself out there, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, you know, that'll go. My, that'll my go. friend used to tell me that every Jamaican is a what you said? Every Jamaican is a superstar, you know? Yeah, man. Every but, Jamaican is an artist, man. Every Jamaican have a song. Every time I yeah. go to Jamaica, I meet people, everyone have their own song. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. a DJ, even from Granny on down. So yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. That's just what, yeah. So you were a singer or more of a DJ? No, no, I was a DJ. And and okay. really and truly though, it I'll send you the link because one of the things that kind of prevent me. And I'm kind of happy because when I was going to school in Jamaica, right out of high school, you have these, you know, these dancer, one of the dancer artists, that's a big artist now. He, I'm, he's not like a cultural artist. I don't know if you ever heard of this guy called Baby Sham. Yeah, but, man, um, I know Baby Sham. I know him. Right, me. Actually, I know his brother. You know, his brother lives in New York. He's a big oh, time uh, spoken word poet, man. Ross Osaka. Baby Sham? The DJ. Yes. Be, re, wow. Yes. Didn't yes. know that. His brother lives in Brooklyn. He has a wow. brother in Brooklyn named Ross Osajifo. And Osajifo is a, he's one of the top spoken word poets in New York, has been so for about 20 years. Had no idea. And he's a Rasta. He's a Rasta man. Yeah. He's a Rasta man poet. Because Baby Shop, his not brother Rasta, is Baby Baby Shop is not a Rasta. Rasta yeah, yeah. Rasta. His, but that's his brother. His brother's Baby Sham. Amazing. Because me and yeah. Baby Sham used to be in the same class together. Oh. And we were coming up this time when Bujo come out. I used, actually used to go to the studio. And mm -hmm. I was, but it's what happened is that I dropped the bar because I'm shy. I don't like to be out in the in the limelight and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But literally, the song I remember when I was in class, Baby Sham was the one that forced me to go to the studio because you know when you're in school I'm beating the desk. I'm, he said, if you don't do this song, I am going to do it, and this is what's gonna. And I did the song, but what happened is that my friend tried to produce the song and it just never come out but this but i got a lot of dub plates you're familiar with dub plates right of course of course back in oh. the 90s i made like five thousand dollars on dub plates in jamaica that's a lot so i had yeah. a lot of sound playing me special. Oh, okay yeah i'd love to hear your things man but what i do i send you something i'm gonna when i come off here i'm gonna send you yeah, um, send something that i did recently regarding credit and all then right. you know all right. Yeah, man. Well, I'm you, man. I'm gonna link you with Osaja for two, man. It'd probably be good for yeah. you to link him. But, He's in Brooklyn. But I'm not doing music anymore, though, man. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but just from you know his brother. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They're talking yeah. about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. And this All is right. from school days. I haven't spoken to him since then. This was back in high school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man. All right, King. Give All right. All right, brethren. I love. Yeah.